Hey guys, welcome back to this Flutter game development series where we are making a 2D top-down space shooter called Space Escape using the Flame Engine. In the last video, we added a simple hit point system for enemies along with a smart enemy manager which increases level of enemies depending on current score of player. So now almost all of the gameplay mechanics that we wanted are in place. But you can see that if I try to restart the game, all the progress from previous session just gets lost. And we again start out with zero money and the default spaceship. So in this video, I'm going to add some code which will store player's progress persistently to the disk. To be specific, we'll be storing an object of player data class. And to do that, we'll need four packages. First one is Hive. Hive is a fast key value database which can store almost any Dart object to the disk. So I'll copy this dependency and add it to our pub spec file. Then the next package is Hive Generator. This package helps in defining how objects of user defined classes should be stored and read from the Hive database. We'll need this for reading and writing objects of player data. Next, to initialize Hive, we'll need to get the path of our app's documents directory. For this, we'll need path provider package. We'll add this dependency to our pub spec as well. And finally, we'll need the build runner package. This package helps in auto-generating new code based on annotations in existing code. And keep in mind that this dependency is not for the final executable. This is just a development dependency. So I'll add it to the dev dependencies section in pub spec. Now let's save this and let flutter pub pull all the new packages. Okay, now let's go to the player data dot dart file and add some lines to make the object of player data class storable in Hive. So first, we'll have to use the Hive type annotation on player data class and provide it a type ID. Type ID can be any integer between the range 0 and 223. The only important thing is each class that we are trying to save in Hive should have a unique type ID. So here I'll just set type ID as 0. Then next, we'll also have to annotate each data member of this class with Hive field. And similar to Hive type, Hive field also needs a unique integer identifier within the class. So I'll quickly add Hive field with unique IDs for all the data members except current score because it is a transient data which does not need to be stored on disk. Now you can see that the spaceship type member is actually another data type that we have defined. So to make this work, we'll have to annotate spaceship type as well. And even though this is an enum, the annotation style will be still similar to that of a class. So for the type ID in hive type, I'll use one to make it unique across the app. And for the members, I'll use field IDs from 0 till 7. Okay, so once we are done with all the annotations, we'll have to use the part keyword in both these files and specify name of the corresponding auto-generated files. These files will have same name as their parent files, but instead of .dart, we'll have .g.dart extension. And that is it. Now we just have to run the build runner command to generate these new files. We'll find this command in the documentation of Hype. It will be somewhere under the generate adapter section. So let's just copy this command and run it inside the integrated terminal in VS Code. And for the first time, it might take some time. But once this completes, two new files will be generated in the models directory. And these files will contain code for reading and writing objects of player data and spaceship type. Okay. Now let's add some code in main.dart to read stored player data as soon as this app starts. And for this, the first thing that we need to do is initialize Hive. So in the main method, before calling run app, I'll call init Hive, which I'll define in the same file. Inside this function, I'll call hive.init method. This method needs a path where Hive should be initialized and can store all the data persistently. And the best place for this is the app's documents directory. So to get this directory, we can use the get application document directory function from path provider package. As this method returns a future, I'll await for it to complete and then store it in a variable called dare. 
and to use await in this function we'll have to mark it as async so once we have this directory we can pass in dir.path as input to hive.init next it is also necessary for us to tell hive which classes it should use for reading and writing custom objects this can be done by using hive.register adapter method and I'll register both player data adapter and spaceship type adapter here. This completes the code for initializing Hive. Next, we can now start actually reading data from Hive. So in this run app function, you can see that we have this change notifier provider of player data, which right now just creates a default player data object and exposes it to rest of the game. But now instead of this default data, we need to fetch data from Hive. And as the read operation from Hive is asynchronous, we'll have to deal with futures. So first, I'll wrap this change notifier with the future provider widget. This future provider will need a create function, some initial data, and will be of type player data. Now for the initial data, I'll cut and paste this code from create of change notifier provider. This will ensure that rest of the app gets some initial data until the future completes. Then next, I'll create one more function in this file called getPlayerData. This function will be responsible for actually reading player data from Hive. So the first thing that I'll do here is, I'll call hive.openbox with name of the box as playerDataBox. And for type of the box, I'll use playerData. If a box with this name exists in Hive, then it will be opened. Else, a new box with this name will be created by Hive. As openbox also returns a future, I'll await for it and store the return value in a variable called box. Now once we have this box, we can call get method on it to get stored data at any key. So here I'll use the string player data as key and store the return value in a variable called player data. Now obviously when this app will be launched for the first time on any device, this box will be empty. In such case, value of player data will be null. Here, if we get player data is null, we'll first have to store some default values in the hive box. And for this, I'll use the box.put method. Key parameter for this method will be again player data. And for value, I'll again reuse the default player data creation code. So once all this is done, we can simply return box.get with key as player data. Also, return type of this function will be future of player data. And we are getting an error at this return statement because box.get returns a nullable player data. But since we have made sure that the box will never be empty when code execution reaches this point, we'll add a not at its end to forcefully cast it to non-nullable player data. Also, as player data is the first place where we access Hive, we can call and await for init Hive here instead of the main function. Now in the create of future provider, I can use this get player data function. This will create and expose the stored player data to rest of the widget tree. Next, as we want to access this player data in the very next change notifier provider widget, we'll have to use the builder function of future provider. This function takes a build context and a child as input and should return a widget. So I'll just return all this change notifier provider code from this builder function. But now you can see that this main app does not depend on player data directly. Which means I can pass this as a child parameter to future provider and inside the builder function it will be available as child variable. This will essentially save us from unnecessary widget rebuilds. Now in this change notifier provider, we don't need to create an object of player data because that will be done by future provider above it. Change notifier provider just has to reuse it. Here, instead of the default constructor, I'll use the dot value named constructor, which will require us to replace create property with value. And to get the player data from upstream, we can use the provider dot off method with context as input and type as player data. So now we are almost done. With this much code, we'll be able to read player data from Hive. But that is not enough. We will also have to make sure that we store the player data to Hive whenever there is some change in it. And to do that, we'll have to again go to the player data class. 
here I'll use the with keyword and add the hive box mixin to this class. This mixin adds some handy method like save and delete to our class which can be called to save an object to hive or delete it from hive. So in our case you can see that their data class has some query methods that do not modify the object. But then we have methods like buy and equip which actually do modify the object. So in such methods once all the modifications to the object are done I'll just call the save method. This will make sure that the updated object gets saved in the hive box. Similarly in the player.dart file in add to score method I'll call save method on player data at the end so that the updated money gets stored to hive. Now let's build and run this to see if it works. Ok, so I'll destroy some enemies to increase the score and then I'll exit the game at a score of 13. And now if I hot restart the game, the stored player data should be red and amount of money should be 13. And yes, as you can see, we indeed have money as 13. This means now all the player progress is getting saved persistently and can be accessed across multiple sessions. Now before we end this video, let's quickly do some refactoring in this player.dart file. Here you can see that for tracking player score, we have two variables, score and player data dot current score. But one of them is redundant, so let's get rid of the score variable. First, I'll remove this int score field from this class. Then next, from the score getter, we can return player data dot current score. This makes sure that existing code accessing score from outside the class does not break. Next, in the reset method, instead of score, I'll now reset player data dot current score to zero. And finally, in the add to score method, we can remove this line and increase player data dot current score directly with input points. There are some more changes that I made in the player data class for updating high score automatically whenever current score changes. But since I don't have any plans to display the high score anywhere in the game right now, those changes really don't matter. Still, if you really want to, you can get those changes from the GitHub repository of this project. Anyways, that being said, that was all for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you did, do hit that like button and maybe consider subscribing for more such content. I hope to see you in the next one.